I'm gonna stay down here because I have notes and I can't read them from up there. So I'll walk around a little bit, but hopefully not too much. Um, I'm Clay, I work for Google in its uh, last 12 and a half years, which is a crazy long time. Uh, been managing Macs and, and Unix machines since the 90s. I was pretty happy when Next bought Apple um, and uh, sort of emerged the two things that I like. Um, I've also recently become a certificated, which is the right word in the US, uh, private pilot. This was actually two days before I left on this trip. Um, none of this, none, actually, none, no part of being a private pilot is actually practical. It's uh, basically I had a lot of extra money I needed to get rid of quickly. Um, so I decided, as I, I've said before, I'm just turning dead dinosaurs into dead dinosaurs into noise, flying around in circles. It's not really, it's a lot of fun. It's something I wanted to do for a long time. Uh, and of course, as a private pilot, I have to tell everyone I'm a pilot. That's sort of like the rule. Uh, how you know at a party, if anyone's a pilot, don't worry, they'll tell you. Um, and so I'll talk about, I'll talk, I can talk about this a lot, but I'll, instead I'll go to my actual talk. So I have a story. So legends tell us. Uh, way back, a long time ago, Macs were just a small portion of the fleet at Google. Um, it was well over 10 years ago. Uh, we had about, I don't know, 1,000, 2,000 Macs. It seemed, that seemed like an absurd number to me at the time. I'm like, 1,000, oh my god, how could we do that much? Um, they were essentially unmanaged. Um, you know, we sort of plopped on like a golden master. This is the time, this is back in the days when you would just set up a machine, log in, configure it, uh, sort of log out, and then like burn an image of that thing you just configured and put on everyone's machine. So occasionally you would have weird things like everyone's printing to the same printer because that's the one you happened to print from that one time. Um, we got them under management, which is a pretty wild story. I, if I have time at the end, I'll, I'll share that or you can ask me later. Um, still a pretty small percentage of the fleets, things were they were nice and calm. It was a relaxing time. Ed was around. He remembers Q4 2009. It was just the two of us. Nothing was going on. Very calm, quiet. Until they weren't. Um, uh, oh, sorry. I have a mistake on that. That's better. An evil wizard. Um, this was the uh, Aurora attack that uh, hit Google and a lot of other companies in late 2009, early, early 2010. Uh, a lot of things happened. Uh, we made a change at Google to focus a lot of the people that were using uh, Windows machines to move them over to uh, Mac OS. Our security people at the time thought that was a good idea. I think now they're less, less certain about that. But uh, we're, we became the largest desktop platform at Google. Uh, we're actually sort of neck and neck with the Linux folks. It depends on what week you ask, what numbers you're counting, I guess. <clears throat> so there's seven hardworking dwarves on the team. Uh, there's Happy, Doc, Dopey, Grumpy, Sneezy, Sleepy, and Bashful. And uh, Ed Eigerman actually came up with these names, so he picked Dopey for himself. Uh, so we're all in a magic castle in New York City. It's nice. Uh, the logo is a little different. I think that's the, yeah, that's the old logo. Um, the front of the building's changed a little bit, but it still looks the same. Um, all of us except for Jeff, who works in a magic castle in Sunnyvale, California, which is right close to our main headquarters in Mountain View. Uh, the four desktop OSs that we support inside Google uh, for, the, for the users, uh, for the employees. There's, uh, I'll, I'll talk about these logos in a second. So there's Mac OS, uh, Windows, Linux, and Chrome OS. Uh, Mac OS and Linux are the most numerous. Um, quite a few people still uh, running Windows, uh, and Chrome OS is sort of rushing up pretty well. There's a, uh, sort of a push internally to have more people trying to use Chrome OS where, where feasible, which is, which is pretty nice. I mean, certainly our security team loves uh, Chrome OS for lots of obvious reasons. 
Uh, we have a lot of Android and iOS uh, devices, obviously, in, inside the company. Thankfully, I don't have to manage those, because that seems like a lot of work. Um, the, the logo, so it, that's a Google material design, which is the internal sort of the new Google design uh, version of Hexley. And Hexley is the platypus logo for Darwin OS, which is the underlying OS for, for Mac OS. Uh, so we, this is the only shout out to Australia I have in my whole slide deck. Uh, so we have about 100,000 Macs. I was hoping we would actually be officially over 100,000 Macs by the time of this, but I checked this morning. We have, um, I can give you, let me say, this is a very precise but not accurate number. Uh, 98,371 30-day actives. So that's machines that have shown up on our management tools in the last 30 days. Uh, that's, so I gave, this, I gave a similar talk, Ed Eigerman and I gave a similar talk in December of 2013 at the LISA conference in DC. Uh, at that point, there were 43,207, which seemed like an absurd amount. Uh, that's, so that's almost double from four and a half years ago. And if you do the math, which I did because that's the things you do, that's about 32 new Macintosh computers every day, seven days a week. Uh, also works out to 14,000 Macintoshes per team member, which seems like a pretty good ratio. Um, so in 2010, when this big push started, we actually went from around 10,000 Macs to about 20,000 Macs within the course of uh, like two quarters, maybe two and a half quarters. Our Apple sales rep, not even kidding, he retired. Yeah, he, he I mean, he had been with Apple for a while, so he had a lot of old stock, but his, the, the, the massive bonuses from selling 10,000 Macs in two quarters really sort of helped. Yeah, it was pretty good. So talk a little bit about the, the Google way of, of doing these things. Uh, site reliability engineering, which is what our, our team is, part of the site reliability engineers uh, group uh, at Google, it's what you get when you treat operations as if it's a software problem. Uh, so all of these Macs, we try to manage them in this sort of Googly way. Uh, as a SRE team, site reliability team, which is sort of a DevOps uh, setup, uh, we have sort of these principles of operation. So. We use open source tools uh, where possible. Obviously, we can't do that everywhere. Um, use, when we can't do that, we tend to default to writing our own tool, uh, and then we open source it. We lead it to the community. Usually, that uh, gets some good uptake. Obviously, if you solve the problem, it's good to share that around. Uh, and we, we want to have everything be uh, repeatable, automated, reviewable, and documented. Uh, and a big thing in the last, since basically since 2010, there is no privileged network. We don't trust anything. Uh, what's the, the saying? It's, it's not paranoia if they really are out to get you. Uh, we, <laughs> we stay secure, and uh, we try to run Google on Google. So I'll talk about all these uh, separately. Uh, using open source tools. We use several. Uh, this isn't a comprehensive list, but this is a, a small collection. So Puppet Factor for configuration management. Uh, we use uh, Monkey for package deployment, uh, the luggage for package creation, uh, sort of like auto package, except not as nice. Uh, OS Query, uh, we're moving to that uh, away from Factor. It's complicated. Um, and we really don't have much commercial software. The only one that we really use is uh, antivirus, and honestly, we're not very thrilled about using antivirus on the operation side of things. The security people like it because of signals, but uh, yeah. there's always friendly discussions uh, about antivirus. Um, Puppet, and if you're not aware, it's uh, Ruby-based. Uh, it's got a custom configuration language. Uh, it's all sort of a declarative statement. You, you, you write the the manifest describing the state of the machine as you would like it, and then every time Puppet runs, it makes sure the state of the machine matches what you've told it to be. Uh, our fleet is uh, very mobile. It's almost entirely uh, laptops. So uh, Puppet traditionally has a 
sort of a, a master, a whole bunch of puppet master servers that the clients then connect to. Um, that's pretty difficult when you don't trust the network you're on and you don't want to have uh, any sort of complicated reverse proxies going through the machines to talk to the servers. So instead, we, we set up what is this, we're calling it, it's a master list, but rather than call it what it's not, we call it what it is, it's standalone puppets, uh, where we grab all of the manifests, uh, generate all the manifests as files, ship those down to the machines, and then they expand them locally and apply them locally. So it's basically, in some ways, we went from having a few dozen puppet servers to 100,000 puppet servers, but it is much easier to manage this way. Uh, factor is another part of uh, Puppet. It's generally, it, it sort of makes facts up for the very state of the machine. Uh, we've extended this uh, way too much to, to gather all sorts of other data that's not related to the configuration side of the machine. Uh, so we use it as part of inventory management and our monitoring infrastructure, uh, which is one reason we're moving to OS Query because it sort of got overloaded in Factor. Um, it was, this is also used to be in Ruby. Now they've rewritten Factor to be uh, native uh, C++ uh, stuff. The actual facts you write can be in Ruby or also non-Ruby um, facts are, are, are possible. I think uh, everyone here probably knows about Monkey or has at least heard of it. Uh, we use this to, for package management, the UI similar to the App Store. Uh, you can do on-demand, force installs, force by dates. So you can say this package must be installed by this date, and you get increasingly urgent notifications to install this thing, at which, and then at the deadline, it'll actually log the person out and install the package, uh, whether, they're, whether they want it or not. It makes our security team happy, makes us happy. We keep everyone uh, up to date. Uh, created by Greg Nagel at uh, Disney Animation. Uh, it, pretty good stuff. A lot of use across the Mac Admin community. Uh, the luggage is sort of the sort of an oddball thing. It's Makefile based uh, package creation tool for from for Mac OS. Uh, similar to auto package, there's like recipes. In this case, they're just make files, uh, so they're they're kind of gross. They look like this. This is a very very simple version. The the they can get really they can get really complicated. Um, we did this because I think Ed mentioned a little bit about auto package and the source of truth and what you're trusting upstream and downstream. And we never got around to like getting that auto package uh, trust to the level we wanted. So we're using this, these uh, make files. And we store the source for the packages that we download and create inter internally on internal servers. So anytime we make a package, we're using a known good version of the source files. Uh, OS query. It is fantastic. There's been a lot of uptake in the Mac community lately. Um, uh, it helps really maintain the uh, insight into the state of the, uh, of the machine. You can do uh, logging uh, plugins, which are great. So not, normally, it'll just log to files, but you can also set up a custom plugins. In this case, we, we're starting to log in directly to our uh, data collection endpoint. So all of, the, all of the data we collect about the machine gets shipped up, um, collated. Our analysts can look at it and make decisions. Uh, from there. It's, it's, it's very nice. It's SQL-based language, yeah, definitely worth looking into. Uh, when we don't have anything out there that's suitable, we, we tend to write our own thing before we try to buy something, because uh, a bunch of engineers, and that's just kind of the thing you work on. Uh, we've done this quite a bit at Google so far. We've got Simeon, Plan B, a bunch of things. Uh, we don't really plan on stopping. We tend to when we're writing a new tool or a new service for, to manage the machines, we usually tend to, very early on in, in the design process, think of how can we open source this? Or is, are we writing this in a way that we can release it to the community and let other people, uh, other, other Mac administrators and other people actually uh, get use out of this? Uh, and it's good to think of that certainly ahead of time and you don't tie yourself into specific internal APIs or, or requirements. Uh, Simeon, it's a, this is running on App Engine. It's a, a server for Monkey. Uh, we built this in-house, uh, then open sourced it. Um, works pretty well for us. Since it's on App Engine, that means it'll deliver updates to Google Maps, Google Macs, uh, anywhere in the world, as long as they are on the internet. Uh, also, it scales for us. We're not managing uh, hardware anywhere. We're just managing this App Engine application, and the back-end people Snapchat, basically. Uh, they, 
since App Engine, most of the most of the stuff is Snapchat. Uh, they can, if they can handle Snapchat, it can handle uh, Simeon and our little bits of data that that scales up pretty well. Uh, I mean, we basically with very few changes to the Simeon code base, we've managed to scale this from handling a few thousand machines to now a hundred thousand machines. Uh, without any changes on our side. The, the App Engine backend scales everything for us. Uh, Santa is fantastic. We, we were trying to think of ways to um, secure the fleet more. Uh, our security team wanted us to get a binary whitelisting uh, of some sort, which is basically uh, the intention is that any binary that a user wants to run or that the system wants to execute must be explicitly allowed ahead of time. Like if, it's, if you haven't said, yes, this is OK, it's blocked. Uh, this is an example for like a, a like a GUI app, but this the same thing occurs for any application, any binary on the machine, any system level daemon. Um, it does seem a little crazy, but it dramatically reduces your attack surface. If the malware cannot execute, then it's not going to run. I mean, they just block blocked from default. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of ways to to make this simpler. You can uh, by, you can whitelist by signing certificates. And, signing certificate since most code on macOS is signed. For example, we sign, uh, we allow everything that the Apple core OS um, signing certificate allows. Uh, obviously, we want the entire OS to run. Uh, and then you can also uh, you know, add other certificates by developers that you trust, or even if you don't trust, maybe you should allow anyway, like maybe Adobe. Um, upvote, obviously, trying to manage all these files. You have all these rules and trying to, you know, we have 100,000 users, and trying to decide for them on, I don't know, probably half a million different binaries that they're running across all of these machines, which sounds like a horrible pain in the neck for an administrator. So we wrote Upvote, which is in another App Engine-based server. Uh, this talks to, um, uh, yes, it talks to uh, Bit9, which is a binary whitelisting for Windows. Uh, so both of those, it's social voting. So it's, it's fantastic because the users can decide for themselves if something's trustworthy or not. Uh, that also sounds a little crazy, but you can have thresholds. And the way we set it up is the first time the user runs and they get the block dialogue, they've downloaded, I don't know, a game or some utility they want to play or want to use, they'll get the block dialogue. They go to this, they'll get a screen like this, and they can say, yes, I want to run this. They just have to find one other person to agree with them and also click that button. And then those two people are allowed to run that program. No one else, just those two people. And anyone else who then says yes, they can go and run that uh, program. Once they get to a certain threshold, once you get, I think we said 50, once at least 50 people have voted for it or administrators have decided it's OK, then it's globally whitelisted. Uh, this works, uh, th this satisfies our security people because it slows down the spread of malware. Like if someone did click on that malware and says, that's probably OK, and then find someone else that says, sure, why not? I'll click this button for you. That's still just those two people. Uh, and if that malware then tries to spread to a third person, that third person will then have to see the dialogue, go to the screen, and maybe someone eventually will probably think about it and, and, and then block it and go from there. Uh, a, brief, a brief aside before I go into the next tool, um, users can do terrible things. We were checking uh, to make sure that the users were running Puppet on their machines. This is several years ago, um, before we would give them a machine certificate. Uh, and someone actually filed this ticket in our support queue. I don't know why they thought Puppet came with viruses, but they were trying to avoid running Puppet just to get the machine certificate so they could access everything. Uh, so this is, you know, they were working on ways to, to block Puppet. They were trying to block the management tools. So. You want to work around that. Um, like I said, the users do terrible things, but we're administrators, and we can all do terrible things as well by accident. And so having a safety net for these sort of situations is very important. Um, Plan B, it's an Objective-C program. Uh, we just, there's a small script that just checks and sees if the management tools that we care about have run successfully recently. Uh, usually we say three days. If it has, hasn't run successfully in three days, then Plan B runs, it downloads packages to uh, reinstall the management tools, and then another package that just runs those management tools directly. Uh, sort of a stopgap. So if something goes wrong, we push some bad configuration out, plan B will eventually pick it up because the machines will stop checking in, and then you know, our bacon has been saved. Uh, plenty of others. Uh, 
JMAC PyUtil collection of Python modules, Cauliflower Vest, which I think is the best name. It's the uh, anagram for File Vault escrow, so it'll back up uh, File Vault keys, sort of like Crypt does. Uh, I think it's Graham's Crypt program. Uh, uh, Cauliflower Vest actually supports BitLocker keys for Windows, uh, Luke's keys for Linux, as well as Duplicity. If you're using Duplicity for backup, it'll store those recovery keys. Uh, and plenty of others. This is not, again, a comprehensive list. There's a bunch of um, bunch of other tools and frameworks that we've open sourced as well on the, from the team. So everything should be repeatable, automated, reviewable, and documented. And these are all uh, pretty important to us. So repeatability means that if you do something and then I do the same thing again, I'm going to get the same output. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to build this package and then a day later I build the same package. I want to something happen with the one I, I, I built before. I want to build the same version of the same package again. So you want to make sure anyone, you and anyone in your team can recreate what you did uh, using the same, you know, and get the same thing out, same, same thing out of it. Uh, we do this with uh, the luggage, system images when imaging was still alive, sort of, uh, with auto damage. Uh, you could use auto package to the same thing in, in your organization. I, definitely make sure that what you're doing can be repeatable and uh, consistently done by anyone just following your documentation. Everything should be automated. Uh, if there's 15 steps to do some to fix some problem, you should probably write a script on that. Uh, if you're SSHing into every Macintosh on your fleets to do something, you should probably automate that. I mean, you, you, that's probably doing it wrong. You should figure out a way to automate this. Uh, I mean, at Google, we don't even have a uh, administrator account on the machines. The, the users are local admins, but we don't have any admin account on the machine that we can access remotely with. Uh, do be wary if over automating things. Uh, sometimes you can spend way too much time automating and then fall into the trap of I'm um, spending all my time fixing this automation stuff and nothing's really happening. Uh, generally, it's better to, to err on the side of automating too much, though. Uh, it's hard to over automate things. You can, you, sometimes you can, but usually you can over automate things. Uh, the alt text for this uh, comic is, is pretty funny. It says, automating comes from the roots auto, meaning self, and mating, meaning screwing. <laughs> uh, everything should be reviewable. Uh, very important. Um, I know, I know, uh, Duncan talked about this. Uh, sort nearly everything in a source control system. All commits require review by someone else. So we put everything in source control. We put everything in... Uh, it, like all the server tools that we have, all admin actions require two admins to do it. We can't... Like, not one admin can't just push a package to the entire fleet. Uh, the entire fleet. Obviously, if you've got a small team, that can be more difficult. But at minimum, make sure that all of your actions are logged so that you, future you can figure out what past you did when your future you is very upset. Uh, I know source control systems can seem very obtuse at times. I get confused by Git every time I use it. Uh, but the utility really fars outway, far, far outweighs the cost of entry. Yeah, I don't even, those are words that I, yeah, I don't. Someone told me this is actually true in some sort of very broad sense, but I don't, these are all, yeah. Uh, everything should be documented, something else I, I think Duncan talked about yesterday. Uh, it's very important with any size organization. So you need a document for your team, document for your users, and almost as importantly, you need a document for yourself. Um, so depending on whether you like negative or positive reinforcement, I have, I have two possible quotes. I'll start with the negative one first. This is a bit dramatic, but it might help motivate you. Uh, just remember that the psychopath might be you that we're talking about, the future one. Uh, this is a little less grim. I like this one a little bit better. Uh, just remember that present you, uh, future you won't remember what present you was thinking. When you wrote that little bit of code and you're like, Oh, I figured out sort of a clever way to solve this. You need to write down in plain English what that clever way was, because in six months you're not going to remember why you thought that was clever or what that even means. Uh, there is no privileged network. Uh, this is, uh, and Ed mentioned this yesterday with Beyond Corp. Uh, we don't trust anything. Uh, traditional perimeter security, it's sort of like a castle. You've got this strong firewall, but once you're inside, it's sort of a soft, gooey interior, and you've got those. Those poor, scared, afraid endpoints that Ed was talking about, you just want to give them a hug. Um, you know, and with a large, largely mobile workforce like we have, 
machines don't spend any time, uh, in our case, even if we had this nice perimeter, machines wouldn't actually spend any time inside the perimeter. They're, they're in cafes and walking around and all over the place. So having a corporate network uh, requirement for any sort of access doesn't really make sense for us. Uh, so we have everything accessible over the public internet, public internet using uh, client certificate auth authentication, which is sort of the beyond corp model. Um, mm -hmm. Simeon and Upvote, for example, they both run on App Engine. They're just directly publicly accessible. We just do some cert certificate auth based on that. Uh, Puppet, we've moved away from the Puppet master servers, as I mentioned. Uh, just shipping files down, that's pretty, that's pretty straightforward and easy to do. Uh, the only requirement that any of our management tools have is a working internet connection. So machines, they all, they certificates basically, it's all machine, uh, enterprise certificates or machine certificates, they all do all, all authorization decisions are made by the proxy, which takes in all of the data it's collected from our management tools, from network scans, all sorts of information, puts them all together. As the machine running the current OS is the, or the management tools run recently, then it makes a decision to give that machine access to the internal uh, sites that they're looking for. And we stay secure. Um, OS updates, they happen a lot. They're pretty a constant stream of things. There's point releases, major OS releases. Security fixes are usually not backported to previous OSs. Occasionally, Apple's done a few of them, but generally speaking, they're not. And if you're a fairly big target like Google, or even if you're not, it's good to stay on top of things and stay updated. Uh, I know this is difficult, especially in uh, academic environments where you've got labs and it's hard to like keep things up to date and you have to keep things similar. But where you can, try to, try to update as fast as you can. Uh, I, I know this is a headache, but it, if you rely on slow to update apps that may not support the new version, you know, but we have to remember that evil wizard from the beginning of the story where they're trying to attack and they're using that, that thing that got fixed in you know, 10.13.5 was, that's, they're using that bug on your 10.13.4 earlier machines to, to get in and access around. Uh, our goal internally is try to do point releases to the entire fleet within two weeks and major OS releases within two months. We're not always successful, but that's what we sort of aim for. Better be a little bit more aggressive and miss a few times than uh, be too conservative on that. Uh, keeping the evil wizards at bay, we, did, we encrypt everything. I, I file vault by, is on by default, uh, especially recently um, file vault is not a uh, performance blocker anymore. It seems, to, in, in, some, in some senses, it even seems to be faster. Uh, I don't know how that worked. Uh, we monitor as much data as we can. I mean, we basically collect all of the logs. We collect all of the data we can. We ship them all up to, uh, from our management tools, from the log systems. Uh, it's, it's easy for us because we can collect all of these logs and ship them into Google's internal production log collection and, and analysis services. Uh, that's not really accessible to the general public, so you'd have to use something like what I had mentioned, which is a Splunk or uh, Elk Stack, uh, which are, you know, something like that. If you can gather all these logs, they're good for uh, making either making decisions in the, in the Beyond Corp model or uh, forensics uh, after the fact. If you found something went wrong or uh, some sort of attack happened or something like that, you can figure it out. Uh, forensics in general are fairly important. Um, we deploy uh, something called GER, uh, which is GRR, stands for GER Rapid Response. Uh, it's an incident response framework based on uh, sort of remote live forensics. So there's a dashboard that our security people have that they can set up, uh, I think they're called hunts. And you have some sort of little query you can ship out, and I want this thing to run on all of the machines, and I want it to run over the next week, and it'll just slowly like send this query out to all these machines, they'll all run this little script you've told them to, they'll get data back. Uh, and it's good for our security team because it uh, allows them, if they see something is currently happening or has just happened, they can look at the machines, check out the fleet. They've seen this, this is what it looks like on this machine that got, uh, got owned, so we can actually see, what this, see if this has occurred anywhere else by doing this uh, query across the whole fleet. Uh, we also, like I we mentioned, we have to ensure the uh, management tools keep running. Uh, we use Plan B, like I mentioned. Uh, we, also, we also compile our own Python and Ruby. Uh, this was more important before, what was it, 1010 that uh, came out with SIP, 10, 11? Anyway, uh, so uh, 
users were much more easy, uh, much more easily able to break Python and Ruby. And since a lot of our management tools are based on Python and Ruby, if they would break Python and Ruby, the management tools would stop working. So we compiled our own Python and Ruby, put them in a special location, uh, and, and used those. It's still possible to break the system interpreters in clever ways, because users are extremely clever at finding ways to break things you had no idea was even possible. Uh, so we tried to do this to limit the damage that the users do. And, Usually, almost almost entirely incident, you know, accidentally, they're not trying to, to, to stop their stuff. They just want to install some clever new thing to work on their uh, to finish their work. Uh, we try to run Google on Google where possible. Uh, this is sort of an internal goal for us, both uh, for our team and Google as a whole. So we have uh, a bunch of amazing infrastructure with uh, App Engine and Compute Engine and a bunch of internal tools like that. Uh, so we should be using it and sort of to manage Google's fleet of machines using Google's own tools. Uh, and we do. We do a pretty good job with that. I think with App Engine especially is great. Oops, sorry. Uh, a little bit about the future. Um, Block-based imaging is in a complicated state. I think Eric said it's not dead yet, but it's kind of dead, but it's not really dead. It depends on the host. Uh, it's, it's a mess. Um, but in any case, if you're not trusting your corporate network, uh, netbooting is sort of a non-starter because you don't trust the netboot server that you're getting it from because that's not authenticated. That's just a bunch of blocks coming down over the wire. So uh, I mean, as, as Apple adds more sort of chain of trust security, you know, with the secure enclave and uh, the OS, everything's sort of encrypted by default. And then there's still a few key, there's a few uh, pieces missing from that that we you know, before we'll trust everything, but. We're moving towards the model uh, that Eric mentioned, where it's using DEP, the device enrollment program, and MDM. Uh, so that basically DEP, Apple resellers give Apple the list of serial numbers that you've bought, uh, that you've purchased. Uh, the machine boots. It talks to Apple, uh, set up assistance, and you get a little dialog box. Uh, you know, want to be managed, uh, or you can just automatically manage things in the DEP world. Uh, our MDM server right now internally, basically uh, on a new machine, uh, puts down a little tiny shim package that basically uh, stops the rest of secure, uh, the setup assistant for running. And then in the background downloads the larger provisioning app, the full like setup, run all of our tools sort of application. Uh, works pretty well, we like that. Uh, so in theory, we could just ship a vanilla machine directly from Apple right to the user's desk, and they could open it up, and everything's good. Our security team still doesn't trust the uh, uh, transportation chain entirely, so we still get the machines, and uh, tech still opens them up and then just re-images them with a vanilla machine and ships them off. So like I said, it's not paranoia if they really are out to get you. Um, we also reevaluate what we're doing as much as possible. Uh, are the configuration package deployment systems that we're using the right ones? We, I mean, almost all the time the answer to that is yes. We've probably made a pretty good decision, but it's still good to question that and look around and see what's changed because things, new systems come up, new tools show up, new ways of doing things uh, show up. Uh, but just because you have a lot of inertia behind something doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. Uh, quick recap, I went over all these things. Use open source tools, write, open, write your own tools where you can. Uh, repeatable, automated, reviewable, documented. Don't trust anything. Uh, stay secure, and we try to run everything with our own sort of dog food. And with that, I thank you. And I have a giant wall of links, but most of this is easily, uh, easily discoverable in other places. If you have any questions. Thank you.